Good morning, JLA Middle Schoolers. It is Mr. Manta. We are coming back at you with a new lesson in our unit on our planet. Today's date is going to be June 2nd of 2020, and that takes us to Lesson 5. Today, we're talking all about the life on Earth. We're talking about plants, talking about animals, talking a little bit even about bacteria, maybe even a little bit of fungus. We'll see. We're going to start off, as we always do, make sure you have your notebooks out. And yes, please label today's lesson, Unit 7, Lesson 5, Life on Earth. And number out numbers 1 through 5 for today's do now. Here's that do now. We're going to be reviewing the questions that we talked about yesterday. Or the questions are going to be reviewing the material we talked about yesterday. You got five questions. Pause the video. Answer these questions from your do now, now. Alright, now assuming that you have completed that, let's see some answers. Refresh those brains, get them wearing away for today's new material. Number one. Scientists classify natural areas around the world into different types of ecosystems called biomes. We learned that word all the way back in Unit 2, and now it's coming back again right now. Number two, the thing that we use the most land for in the United States is raising cattle. Number one, more than anything else, if you traveled all around the United States, the number one thing you would see is big fields of grass with cows roaming around them. Number three, the thing that takes up the second most land in the United States is forests, which is some good news for those of you who love plants and animals and nature. Number four, the thing that takes up the third most land in the, in the United States is growing crops and food. And number five, true or false, most of Earth's surface is covered in land. Ah, that is actually going to be false. We learned in lesson two that 71%, the majority of Earth's land is covered in water, which leaves only 29% a minority to be covered in land. Now, for today's lesson... I want us to think back. We're going to connect this to when we talked when we were in Unit 4 on astronomy, and we talked about trying to colonize different planets around the solar system. Today's lesson is about life on Earth, and in our Unit 4, we talked about how hard it would be to colonize any other planet that we would find in a solar system. We said Mars was probably the easiest planet that we would find to colonize, but heck, even on Mars, you would face problems like really cold temperatures that drop below a 100 degrees Fahrenheit. You might freeze to death. On Mars, they have these huge dust storms that would come through and destroy things and cover up all your solar panels. Oh, and heck, don't forget about the fact that there is lethal amounts of radiation that somehow sometimes bursts on Mars. And if you're caught outside, when it gets you, it can make you really, really sick. So man, trying to live even on the second most habitable planet in our solar system would be a really hard time. In fact, if you made a list, looked at our solar system and made a list, of all the planets that would kill you almost immediately as soon as you set foot on them, you would have a lot of planets on that list. It would include Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. That's seven of the eight planets in our solar system would kill you just about right away. And if you had a list of the planets that support life where you could live in our, sol in our solar system, well, heck, it would be a very short list. It would only be Earth. Look at this happy little Earth smiling back at us. So the fact that Earth can support life is really special. It's really amazing. It's precious. We've yet to discover another planet where we know life exists. And having life on Earth, uh, every time I think about it, just makes me overflowed with joy. It's really teeming with life, this beautiful planet that we are on. You probably grow up learning about the kinds of animals and plants that exist on Earth through books like these ones or books and movies like The Jungle Book. And you see pictures. When I think about life on Earth... I think about all these different varieties of beautiful animal species like chimpanzees and koalas and zebras and, and bears and orangutans and panthers, right? I don't know about unicorns over here. I mean, sorry, Brie, they're not really on Earth, but they're close enough, right? So these are the kind of the animals and the living things that we usually think of or we picture when we talk about life on Earth. But like you guys have probably learned, every lesson in, our in the unit on our planet has a twist in it. And that's going to be our twist for today. Is this really what most life on Earth looks like? I mean, certainly there are all these wild animals, but do they account for most of the living things or just a really small portion of them, right? How many bears and elephants and tigers are there really out in the wild blue yonder? Well, we're going to find out today. Today's big question is going to simply be, what are the most common living things on Earth? Sounds like a simple question. It's going to turn out to be quite challenging. First of all, we run into a problem. If you want to say, well, what are like the most common living things we have here on the Earth's surface? Well, it depends on how you count. So for example, one question you might ask is if you're going to count things to say what's more common, what do we have the most of, should you count each individual animal and plant? 
Like, if you're counting elephants, do you just count one elephant as one? But if you're counting ants, that's equal to having one ant, right? Like, there's ants are tiny, right? So you can have hundreds and thousands of ants, but that doesn't mean that they're more common than a herd of just a few really big elephants. If you try to count the number of individuals, the number of individual insects and plants and animals, you'd find that all the most common, quote-unquote, living creatures on Earth are all just really small things that exist in really big groups, right? So you'd probably th say, well, the most common animals and plants on Earth are the trillions of ants, or the quadrillions of blades of grass that you find out there, or heck, even the quintillions of bacteria which exist, because bacteria are so small that even in like a small area you can have billions and billions of them. But does that mean it's really fair to say that they're more common than something else that's bigger or more common, like, you know, trees and squirrels and stuff that we see more often. We have to wait, find a way to fix this problem instead of just counting individual bacteria and ants and everything. Instead, scientists have a different strategy. Scientists add up the biomass of living creatures in order to account for their different sizes. Now, what the heck is this word biomass? Well, that's one of the key points for today. Make sure you write this down in your notebook. This is a new vocabulary word. Biomass is the total weight of a species' whole population put together. So even if you have a lot of little animals, like a bunch of tiny little ants, they don't have a lot of biomass unless you have a lot of them because you have to add all of their weight together and compare that to the weights of something else. So the way you calculate something's biomass is you say, well, how many of this plant or animal are there? Right? Say that you have 100 trees. Then you say, you multiply that by how heavy each one of them is, what they weigh. Maybe you have 100 trees, and they each weigh 50 pounds. And then together, those allow you to calculate that plant or that animal's total biomass, right? By calculating how many of them there are and how heavy each and one of them are, you calculate the total mass of all those living things together. If this sounds confusing here. I'll show you an example. We're going to try to figure out whether there's more biomass in a group of 10 elephants or a group of a hundred thousand little ants. Let's say we have a little family, a herd of ten elephants. We're going to multiply that by their mass. So on average, an elephant might weigh something like 12,000 kilograms because they're so big. And ten elephants times 12,000 kilograms gives you the result, 120,000 kilograms of elephant in total, if you add them all together. So that group of elephants has 120,000 kilograms of biomass, living, breathing elephant matter, right? Compare that to our 100,000 ants. If we take those 100,000 ants, but multiply them by the fact that they only weigh 0 0.002 kilograms each, well then that would give us a very different result that only adds up to 200 kilograms of ants. So in this case, would you say, hmm, well, do we have more elephants or do we have more ants? If you're counting just by number, obviously we have more ants than we have elephants, but if you're counting by biomass, we have a lot more mass of elephants than we do of ants. And that allows us to compare the numbers of living things a lot more easily because we can take their size into account by talking about biomass. For class your question one, I just want to make sure you guys understand this concept I'm trying to explain. So I want you to tell me what is biomass. Explain what it means in your own words. You do not want to give me the definition that I just gave you. I would not count that. You would not get credit for it. Explain what it means in your own words. Pause the video and answer this classwork question one now. All right, I'm now assuming that you have done that. I'm going to go ahead and move on from there because some of you might be thinking a pretty crazy thought like this little girl. This video makes me laugh, which is, hmm, what if we then calculated the biomass of all the living things on the entire planet? And we added them all together and we compared all the biomasses of all the plants and the animals, the fungi, everything, right? Well, believe it or not, that idea actually isn't that crazy. That is exactly what these scientists already did. These are two scientists, I believe, from a university somewhere in Israel. They're professors at a university. And a couple years ago, they published an article where they took the time to calculate the biomass of all the living things on the entire planet and add them up and compare them. So here are their names down here, and they probably made a bunch of money for doing all that research and publishing that article because other scientists can then take that article and what they learned and do new science with it and answer other questions, right? So we are going to take a look at what these guys right here 
learn from adding up all the biomass of all the living things on the whole freaking planet. Here's what they found. They made this big graphic, essentially. So this is almost like a pie chart. If you take this whole rectangle and you look at how much each of the different colors takes up, that's proportional to how much biomass each of the different categories take up. So if this is 100% of all the biomass on Earth, the first thing that they learned is that most of Earth's biomass is plants. This big green square is all plants. Plants together weigh 450 billion tons if you added up all the plants and put them on a giant scale. And that makes up over 82% of all of the biomass of all the living things that we can find here on Earth. So mostly when we talk about living, about life on Earth, you're mostly talking about plants. And that makes sense because, heck, there are so many plants on Earth. Oh, they make up 82% of the biomass. There are so many plants on Earth that you can even take a picture of the Earth from space. And all that green that you're seeing is all the plants that exist and all the forests and, the, and heck, even the grasslands, all that. Right? So it makes sense that there's so many plants on Earth. They add up to so much biomass. The second thing they found that was interesting, though, is that the second biggest group is bacteria. It's not animals. So this big blue chunk over here represents the weight of all the bacteria that they estimated put together. And even as tiny, teeny, tiny, microscopic as bacteria are, there are so many of them that if you add them together, they make up that much biomass. More than animals, more than fungus, more than all those other groups, which I found really surprising because bacteria are so tiny. You might be looking at this chart, right, because we see some other groups here. We see fungi are down here. And then these other groups, I don't know if you guys have heard about these called archaea and protists that you don't need to know about for my science class. You'll learn about them in high school. But you might look at all these groups and see, okay, there's a lot of plants, a lot of bacteria, but where are all the animals on this graph, huh? All the animals in this graph, in this whole, all of the world's biomass, can be condensed into that tiny little square that we have down here. That's maybe like 1%. I don't even know if it's even that. That maybe like is half of a percent of the biomass makes accounts for all of the animals. So really, compared to plants and bacteria, there aren't a lot of animals on Earth. If we then take that, so if you, if you take this little square that represents all the animals and you zoom in just on that, it looks more like this. This is a breakdown, a graph, of all of the animal biomass on Earth specifically and the different kinds of, kinds of animals that it breaks down into. So, again, if this is 100% of the animals on Earth, it breaks down with each of these different colors that you're looking at. The first thing that I see is that this big green block, in this case, represents a kind of animal called arthropods. Now, arthropods, some of you guys aren't going to like this. Some of you guys are going to think this is great. Arthropods is a fancy scientific way of saying bugs, of saying uh, not even just insects. It's a bigger category than insects. It includes anything that has an exoskeleton, a hard outer shell. So things like mosquitoes and spiders and crabs. And I don't even know what that little guy is, right? any bug or anything with an exoskeleton that you can think of as an arthropod. And in fact, almost, I mean, or not almost, not almost all, but a lot of the living animals on Earth are bugs, are arthropods. The most, the, they're the most common group in terms of biomass on Earth. Second after that is all of the fish. Of course, the Earth is 71% ocean, and so all these fish together that live in the ocean, people say there's plenty of fish in the sea. Well, that's true. There's 7 billion tons of fish in the sea, which is quite a lot, and that makes up 29% of the animal biomass. After that, you have some of these other groups that you guys may or may not have ever heard of, like annelids, which are certain kinds of worms, or mollusks, which I'm really fond of. They're like Mollusks is like snails and octopi and shrimp, or and I think shrimp, and squid and that kind of stuff. You have cnidarians, which is like jellyfish and some kinds of sea creatures. And then after that, you also see pretty big chunks for livestock. So this whole big square is just cows, chickens, pigs, and sheep pretty much that make up all of the livestock on Earth's planet. And a really big chunk that's just human beings. If you take all of the animals that exist around the world, human beings make up 2.5% of all of their biomass. Then down here, you have to look super, super close to find the kinds of animals that we typically think about as being the wild animals that live out, out on Earth. Things like the wild mammals, right? So it's all, mammals are like all of the, any, you know, big animal that you probably want to think of. Bears, cheetahs, lions, uh, elephants, all that kind of stuff. And all of the wild birds that you see down here are just that tiny little bit right here. And heck, 
Reptiles and amphibians, they don't even make it on this graph. They're too small to even see them. To kind of take this big, complicated doc or graph and break it down a little bit more simply and try to summarize it, here's going to be our third key point for the day. And yeah, I want you writing this down. The most common animals on Earth are bugs and fish. And that's not maybe very exciting because most people aren't super fond of bugs and they don't like fish that much better. But hey, that's the truth. The most common animals on Earth are bugs, aka arthropods, and fish. For a few of you guys who do like bugs, Yanelli, Chira, thinking a few guys, well, hey, that's some good news then for you. Second of all, I would also say that looking at that graph, we have a medium amount, kind of in between, of humans and livestock. That's all the cattle and the pigs and the fish on Earth. Not as many as we have bugs and fish on Earth, but still quite a lot of them. And we have really tragically few, very little, wild mammals, wild birds, and reptiles. The reptiles didn't even make it on the graph. So really animals like cheetahs and vultures and iguanas and all these kinds of beautiful wild animals that tend to be people's favorite animals are really, really pretty rare, which is just too bad to think about. Now, you might hear that from Mr. Manta and ask, well, why is that? Why are there so few of these beautiful wild animals and so much of all this other crud that I don't care that much about? Why is it? Are the wild animals and birds being hunted maybe did there used to be a lot more of them but people are killing animals and there now there's hardly any of them left well that's you're partially correct there you're kind of on the right track that doesn't tell the whole story in order to figure out why this group here is so small we got to think back you guys remember this you know think back all the way to unit two when we looked at a lot of food webs we learned that we can use food webs like this to say, okay, which kinds of animals eat other kinds of animals. So I know that this butterfly eats the flowering plant and this frog eats the butterfly, right? And we could kind of trace things along a food web. And we also learned that we could use food webs to kind of categorize animals into different groups, right? So that all the living things at the bottom, most of the plants, we would call producers because they produce energy from the sun, right? And then the things that directly eat the plants, we said we could call herbivores. And then those things that eat the herbivores, we said we could call carnivores. And then all the way at the top of the food chain, we would have our apex predators, right? And we learned that when you take all those plants and animals and you put them together and you count how many of them you have, you usually have a lot of producers and a little bit less herbivores and a little bit less carnivores and then very few apex predators, right? Because, heck, you need like a lot of snakes to support even just one eagle, because an eagle has to eat a whole bunch of them so that it can keep on living. We called these things trophic levels, T-R-O-P-H-I-C, trophic levels. We learned that they basically mean that the higher you go up the food chain, the less and less of an animal you're going to find. Now, the reason that we have so many bugs and fish and so few of these mammals and iguanas and birds and stuff is because... Bugs and fish tend to be our herbivores that just feed directly off of plants. And plants, we learned, are the most common. Whereas things like the wild mammals, right, wolves, pythons, and eagles tend to be carnivores and apex predators. So they aren't as common to find when you look out inside of natural ecosystems. And that was true even before people started hunting animals and causing all kinds of problems, which we're probably going to talk more about tomorrow. But that's why this is going on. I love, as Mr. Manta, I love when my lessons connect from one unit to another. I love pulling up stuff from unit two and seeing back how the stuff I taught you guys back in like November connects to our new lesson today. Because it's true, in science, everything is connected. It's quite amazing. In fact, I love it so much that your second classroom question for today is going to be this. What's something that you remember learning from our geology unit? I know it was a while ago now. It was back in December that we finished geology. Tell me something that you remember learning from it. To give you a hint, I wrote out the names of all the different lessons that we had in geology here. So you can take a look at some of those and see if they jog your memory. And please, please don't tell me I remember learning about whatever, rocks and minerals or layers. That doesn't count. I won't count it if you just say, we learned about this. I need you to tell me what you learned about that. So I learned that, the you know, the layers of the earth are the crust, the whatever. Pick something of your own, looking at all these lessons over here and these, and tell me what it is that you actually learned, not just that you learned about it. Pause the video and answer class for question two for me right now.
Alright, I'm assuming that you've done that. I'm very curious to see what you guys remember from this unit. We'll find out. Alright, that takes us to our independent practice for today. Go ahead, number your notebooks, numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And here are your 8 independent practice questions. See how many of them you can get. Pause the video, answer these 8 independent practice questions now. Uh, all right, all right, ooh, all right, now we're done. I'm assuming that you guys have now done that, you finished. We've got questions one through eight here. Let's read them. Number one, the number one thing that we use the most land for in the United States is raising cattle. Or other words, you can call them cows if you want to, too. It's crazy to me. Number two, list all of the planets in our solar system that support life. Well, it should have been a pretty short, short list because that is only Earth. That is what's so special and precious about living here. Number three, the word that we're looking for is biomass is the total weight of a species' whole population put together. Number four, which makes up more of Earth's biomass, plants or animals? Well, that's definitely going to be plants. They're 82% of all the biomass on Earth. Number five, which makes up more of Earth's biomass, bacteria or animals? Well, heck, that one's going to be bacteria. They even make up more biomass than animals do. Number six, the most common kinds of animals on Earth are bugs. You could also say arthropods, if you're a fancy scientist, and fish. I know, not the most exciting news, but hey, it's true. And number seven, true or false, the Earth has more livestock than wild mammals. That is true. The specific numbers on that I didn't include for this lesson, but it's something like 96% of all the mammals on Earth are livestock. Something I really crazy like that. Number eight. True or false, the Earth has more humans than fish. Oh, well, that's false. Hey, folks, there's plenty of fish in the sea. Never forget it. All right, as always, star those questions you got right, fix the answers you got wrong, and tell me in the classwork forms. And that is going to... Uh, no, that's not going to wrap it up for today. <laughs> I have a surprise for you guys. Things continue to be pretty stressful in the news, and for a lot of ours, us in our lives. So hey, here's a little surprise. To, bright help, to help brighten up our days, for $5, five scholar dollars, tell me in the comments something that made you smile today. I'll tell you guys, something that made me smile today was reading your guys' answers to classwork questions from yesterday. Uh, the first one was like, what do you think are the most, com what do you think you would see if you drove all over across America all the time? And there was really interesting. I think a lot of people thought they would see a lot more buildings and more mountains than we really see. Most of the land, no one guessed that you'd mostly see cows. And uh, the second one was, what are the things we should use more and less land on? Definitely people seem to think we should use less land on golf courses and gas stations, I think. And more land either for growing food for people, or maybe hopefully less land for raising cows, because heck, that's a lot. More land for, you know natural wilderness and more land for things like affordable housing that people also need. That was really great to see and it made me smile. All right, that is actually all that we have for today. It is our exit ticket time. Go knock it out. Hopefully get a three out of three. And today's cool thing, we have some more music today. This is a band called Animals as Leaders. That's the name of the band, but it's starting to sound like a pretty good idea these days. And uh, this is a song that they have called Physical Education. I linked the music video. It's pretty funny. And they're just a very, very talented band. This guy plays a guitar that has like 10 different strings on it. And he plays it incredibly fast. They're really talented. They're really cool. Yeah, I promise it sounds unlike any music you've ever heard before in your life. Check it out if you're curious. All right. That is all that we got for today, folks. I'm going to wrap it up there. Take care and talk to you tomorrow.